I want to preface it this way. Tonight's message was tailor-made for everyone outside the United States. I have ministered this word in my own church, but it took me a whole quarter to preach it. Because in the United States, we have problems. Now, the problem that you think is that we don't have problems, but we have way more problems than you think. Smith Wigglesworth made this statement. He said, it seems as though with the advancement of medical science, it will be more difficult for children of God to believe God for their healings. Because of the access of health care in the United States and prescription drugs and drug stores on every corner, most believers wouldn't even talk to Jesus and say, by his stripes you were healed. They'll just run to Bear. They'll run to Advil. They'll run to some other, um, you know, Benadryl. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking things. I'm just saying we don't even talk to God. Which means then you got to unravel this easy seemingly fix in order for them to actually have faith for healing. Because if you won't talk to God about a headache, you're not going to talk to God about cancer. But in other countries, see, things are more limited. So you're already conditioned to go to Jesus first. And what I'll talk about tonight, our nation is not as conditioned but you are. And this is a message for you because the kingdom works everywhere. I do not have an advantage because I'm in the United States. I do not have an advantage because I'm here. And when we minister tonight, now, again, I know there's a lot of ministers in the house and... We have heard a lot of great teaching and preaching so far. And I'm going to begin in a way that I don't want you to kind of sit and assume you know where I'm going, okay? So please don't do that. (laughs) Just allow yourself to uh, just go along the journey with me so that we can get to where we need to be. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And as we turn there, let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our soul, change our thinking, renew our minds. Now, we ask that the word that's being preached tonight will not come from my voice alone, but it will come by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Now, Holy Spirit, we make a demand that you do what King Jesus said you would do. For King Jesus said, when he comes, that is the spirit of truth, he will cause all things to come to your remembrance. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to guide you into all truth, and he's going to disclose things to come. Holy Spirit, reveal to us through revelation knowledge these truths in the word, and that everyone that hears here personally and online will not accept this as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God. And as they're doers of what they hear tonight, they'll never be the same, nor their nations in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, no one. Now, who's talking? Who's talking here? So if Jesus says this, then you can't do it. No one can serve two masters, so it's impossible for you to serve these two masters. If Jesus says you can't do it, then you can't do it, because God is not a man that he should lie, and Jesus is not lying. But yeah, a lot of people think they can do this verse, even though Jesus says it's impossible to do. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So you can't do it. You can't serve both of them. It can't happen. You're going to serve one or the other. Now, serving one will hinder the other and serving one will bring the other if you serve one you'll hinder one if you serve the other you'll bring the other okay so the word devoted means to hold to firmly to cleave to pay attention to so you'll 
hold firmly, you'll cleave to, you'll pay a heed to. Despise means to disdain, to think little or nothing. So we could see this verse this way, you can't serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other. You'll, be, you'll hold firm to one and you'll think little or nothing of the other. Are you hearing me? Which means if wealth is what you serve, then you think little or nothing of God. Period. And you can't say, I do, I love God, and be serving wealth. You can't do that. You're a liar. Because God says it's impossible to happen. No one can do this. So we need to understand this then. Out of all the religions and idols in the world, This is the one King Jesus says has the capacity to take a position in your heart. And many people, whether they admit it or not, are allowing wealth, money, to dictate their decision making. Now we're going to go on a mission trip. How many of you would like to go? Apostle Estrada says, I'm going to Africa. I'm asking people to come. And then people, this is what they do first. They go to their account. They look at what they have. They say, Apostle, I would really love to go, man. I know, believe what you're doing, but you know what? I just can't do it this year. And they never talk to the Lord once. The Lord says, I want you to go with Apostle Estrada. They look at their account and say, there must be a mistake. I know that I feel like the Lord wants me to go, but I'm just not going to be able to do it this year. So who's governing your life now? Which one is taking a seat in your heart? Money should be looked, should not be looked as a thing as much as it is a relationship. Because you understand, money is not the issue, but your relationship with money is the problem. Now, I understand this is like crazy right now because you're like, you are not Bishop Garraway. Why are you here talking about money right now? (laughs) Who do you think you are having a conversation about finance, right? Well, ultimately, I am not. You'll see here in a minute. But I am setting you up. Amen? So how do you know if you're serving money? So let's do a little what ifs. You might be serving money if you go to work on Monday even when you don't feel like it, but you stay home on Sunday when you feel the same way. You might be serving money. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. What I don't feel like it, you're soul led. Because I can tell you many a Mondays you haven't felt like it. But you seem to put the flesh down and go. Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. (laughs) That's my first what if. All right, y'all ready for another one? Okay. All right. (laughs) You might be serving money if you tolerate bad behavior and conduct at work without quitting But when someone does the same in your church, you quit and find a new one that might, you might be serving money. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean, you will absolutely work 20, 30 years in a career with people you hate. But the minute the usher asks you to move back a seat for somebody, you have found another church. You might be serving money. (laughs) Y'all all right? (laughs) You might be serving money if you are more passionate about receiving a physical promotion at work than a spiritual promotion with God. Now, Pastor, you know I got to do this because, you know, I want to get a promotion at work. Well, I was asking you to come serve with the children. I can't serve with the children because I'm trying to get this promotion at work, Pastor. Oh, it's quiet. (laughs) Maybe I'll just stare at the camera then. (laughs) All right, y'all ready? You, (laughs) can y'all handle another? I got a couple more, but I can go on. I mean, okay. You might be serving money if you are more diligent to study at college or the workplace for wage increases than diligent to study to show yourself approved unto God. Pastor, I can't make a church. I'm studying for my college exams. 
When's the last time you read your Bible? Oh, it's been a while. Why are you going to college anyway? Well, you know, to get a better education so I have a better job, so I'll make more, so I can bless the, you blessing the church because you ain't even around it now. But I love the Lord. I'm serving Jesus. No, you're not. You're deceived. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, the last one. I got one more. No, I'm only one more. I only have one more what if, and then we'll go on. You might be serving money if you're more concerned about how much is in your retirement fund than how much you gave in the church offering. You need to understand there is a way to live so that things are actually added to you, right? Because when you discover how this works, then your work will no longer be your source, but the place you influence with the kingdom and they pay you to do it. You'll quit seeing your work as your source, but this is my mission field and they pay me to be an example for the kingdom. I don't care where you're working. I don't care where they are giving you a paycheck. They're paying you to be a missionary. Oh. If you could shift your thinking just for a moment, you would realize you already have a partner with the corporation you work for. They're funding you to come and influence. But you might be serving money if you think it's just to pay your mortgage. I guess I had one more, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that came up by the Spirit. All right. So let's do a quick test, can we? I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I am a millionaire. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm a millionaire. Say it with a smile. Some of you ain't saying it with a smile. <laughs> okay. Now, let, let's just say, if saying that kind of gives you this like, Ugh. why do we have a problem with rich people anyway? That's the first sign of covetousness. That's the first sign of covetousness if you have a problem with wealthy people. Right? And again, Bishop was very clear. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Money is not an evil thing. Because if it was, why did the Lord tell Peter, go fishing? Because go get the evil stuff. All right. Okay, look to your neighbor and say this, I'm a billionaire. I'm a billionaire. Oh, there you go. See, y'all. some of y'all are already saying that, right? Oh, you said it before. Like, I'm not doing a millionaire. I'm a billionaire. Come on, yeah, right? Okay, let's do one more, right? We know the next level. Let's just go there. Because there, there ain't, I don't know, there's, there's maybe one person that's, that's tapping to that in, the, in our globe right now. Look to your neighbor and say, I am a trillionaire. Right? Right? All right. Now, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, if you are a trillionaire, you're broke. You're broke. Isn't it amazing millionaire, billionaire, and trillionaire has an identity associated with it? And if we can get excited about being known as a millionaire, billionaire, or a trillionaire, then we're really broke people. Because I'm going to show you who you are in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, well, let's make man in our image according to our likeness, and let him have. Now look to your neighbor and say, I'm a dominionaire. I'm a dominionaire. Because the minute you become a millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, and that's your identity, you limited yourself to just natural currency. But God, notice what he said, let us make man in our image, corner of our life, and let them be a trillionaire. No, let them have dominion over 
over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over uh, the cattle, over all the, all the earth, over every creamy thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Here's the account of this particular conversation. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. The Lord God planted the garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he formed. Out of the ground, the Lord call, uh, God caused, um, where am I, uh, sorry, 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 verse 9. Out of the ground, the Lord call, God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing in the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, a river flowed out of Eden to water the um, garden and from there is divided and became four rivers there's this first one and it flowed through a land where there is where what's there what's that anybody know what it, uh, gold is uh, the dollar figure per ounce today is 1800 one ounce is about 1800 US dollars and he has been given a land that there's gold now let's see what he says about the gold verse 12 the gold of that land is what is it didn't say it was bad. Notice we go through all of creation and said this is the first thing. God said it was. And God said it was. And God said it. And then we get verse 2 and he says gold was what? It was good. Didn't say it was evil. He said the gold of that land is good and, and, and um, delum and the uh, uh, ox, onyx stone are there. So there were natural minerals. Not just did he have dominion over the fish, the birds, the cattle, the creeping, but over all the earth, and in the earth was gold. So his dominion gave him access to wealth. His dominion. And it's more important that we recognize our dominion heir status then our financial status because when you start to take a step back you begin to look if you want money get in dominion because dominion has money but if you're only focused on money then you don't have what's outside of money because there's some things that money can't buy Let's go on. Um, verse 13, there's a second river. It flowed through the land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flowed east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good, uh, good you shall not eat, for on the day you eat you will surely what? Die. So, this earth that he's talking about in Genesis chapter 2, is it the same one we're on right now? Is it this one? Is it the same one? Is the river Euphrates still in the planet? And the Tigris? Now the other ones, I don't know if they got them named over there, but at the end of the day, they were there somewhere. Which tells us there must be a land that's got gold. Now I know there's gold in Africa. Oh, <laughs> who owns that gold? Okay. It seems as if the financially-centric people who are the millionaire, billionaire, trillionaires are the owners. But if you would take a step back with dominion, then you'd realize it's mine. It's the same planet. God, when Adam fell from dominion, he did not fall from heaven. The resources did not leave the planet. The, it was transferred, a dominion was transferred over to the devil that now creates systems, get this now, systems to use the resources that were rightly Ours. Here's the problem though. 
The problem is that the devil deals in death. He comes to kill, steal, and everything he touches dies. Here's the problem with the devil. Everything he puts his hand on that's a resource for man begins to break. So he is peddling death because even if he gives you something shiny today, tomorrow it'll rust. Because his realm of dominion is a death realm and he can't access the heaven realm of light. Of life. So when we get around something, we can bring life back in into a substance that was rightfully out. He'll never be able to multiply. All he does, it's like when Hitler was in Germany, he didn't have more tanks. He moved them around to make it look like he had something he didn't have. The devil's resource is no more than what the God put in him because sin's in the earth and, sin, and earth is travailing. If none of us got right with God, it would all implode on itself. It would all be destroyed. But the minute life shows up, it can touch a substance and cause it to multiply because dominion will give multiplication. Come on, y'all all right? In math, go back to Matthew 6, 24. That's where we start. It says, no one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other. He'll be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Jump down to verse 32, because in between all that, you know what it says. It says, don't worry about what you're going to eat and drink and wear. In fact, why are you worrying about trying to build a life? I mean, the birds are are ordained by God through his spoken word on how to exist, and they have no care. The lilies of the field, no care. Aren't you worth more? And if your heavenly Father clothed these things, how much more worth? So what do you got to do? Verse 32, the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things which they're in the domain of death, because when we were dead without Christ, we were in the domain of darkness, which is a death realm. And everything we touch is dies. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it is death. And it doesn't matter what we're doing. Even if we seem to be prospering, we're only dying. And everything we have is actually dying. But the minute you kick over into the kingdom of his beloved son, I said when you kick over into the kingdom of his beloved son, then what they are running after, your heavenly father knows you need those things, so how do you get those things? 33, seek first his kingdom, king's dominion, and his righteousness, and all these things will be, they'll run you down. They'll come find you. And they'll come find you because all you have to do is call. God said, let there be because he has dominion and it shows up. Christ came back not to take us to heaven, but to bring his nature and heaven's rule back in us so when we're on the planet we instantly become dominionaires we're dominionaires right now so if a trillion needs to be in your account then get it there for your purpose because I mean, if we could do, okay, let me go on. I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, there's the greatest transfer of wealth coming to those who hear my voice and obey my command. For everything that can be shaken will be shaken, and my righteous ones shall receive by faith, for they have been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken nor has no end. I'm going to say that again. 
I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, there is the greatest transfer of wealth coming to those who hear my voice and obey my command. For everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And my righteous ones shall receive by faith, for they have been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken nor has no end. And when I heard the Spirit of the Lord say that, this came up. We need an obedience seminar more than we need a financial seminar. We need an obedience seminar more than we need a financial seminar. Do we need to learn about money? Yes. Again, if, if, if Bishop Garraway and I could get locked up in a room for about 30 days, we're probably going to take all the wealth of the world. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, because we're tracking some things, and I need him. I need him. Because there is an untapped resource that's due me. Do me because I'm a child of the king. And here's the thing. The earth is crying out for the sons of God to be revealed. Which you understand, the gold in Congo, Congo is waiting to hear your voice. Don't let it transfer all the way to the U.S. to buy it. Mark chapter 6. We must become dominion heirs. Again, I am aggressively seeking to know how to possess finance for the purpose it is and is for the furthering of the kingdom. But that's just one aspect. And because I'm a dominion heir, I know that I'm not limited to it. In fact, I never let it come out of my mouth. I never let it come out of my mouth. Well, we could do more if we just had more. Because now that's putting my trust in the money. I mean, I'm limited because of my res. How am I limited because of my resource? How am I limited? I am not limited. I'm a dominion heir. Because I have access to a realm that can do stuff with very little. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 30, 31. And I'm going to insert another section kind of in where I think the other gospel might have included, okay? And he said to them, come away by yourself to a secluded place and rest a while. And there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And they went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves, and the people saw them going, and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them, for uh, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to what? Teach them many things. And when he had, uh, and and when it had, uh, and when it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, "This place is desolate, and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and what, buy themselves something to eat." But when he answered, "You give them something to eat," and they said to him, "Look what they said now. Shall we go and spend?" 200 denarian. Now, a denarian was one day's wage. On bread and give them something to eat. Now, why would they even suggest an amount if they didn't have it? And you understand they had money because Judas cannot be skimming off a broke Jesus. You can't embezzle. I've never heard of someone embezzling money from a poor person. Have you ever heard that? Has anyone ever gone to jail for embezzlement over 
three cents that they stole from somebody who had a dollar. <laughs> no, Jesus had wealth. In fact, if you study, because again, we're so commercialized here in the United States, right? It's pathetic. And so, you know, we got our little trinket things that we put around our Christmas tree. We have Christmas trees. Okay. <laughs> And we put our little nativity set. That's a lie. Because it has the shepherds and the wise men all on the same day at the birth of Christ. And that's not biblical. But just because they brought three gifts, we assume there were three guys. Yet all of Jerusalem is upset when three guys show up with three little boxes. It says all of Jerusalem was troubled when the wise men showed up. They had so much wealth with them, they brought an army to make sure nobody stole. And their gifts financed Jesus' life. In fact, one Greek scholar believes that Jesus' money went over to his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph of Arimathea, as you know, was the one who went to... And you understand, a poor person's not going to Pilate to ask for Jesus. So when finance is necessary, it's necessary. And God needed. And Jesus, you know, you do not gamble for a beggar's clothes. Okay. So when they say, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread? That means they had capacity to finance the bread. At least for there. Now, from here, we need to insert another gospel. And that is John chapter 6, verse 5 and 7. Because it says that they said, which means disciples were communicating. How many disciples were there at this time? Of Jesus's? Twelve. The twelve. Okay, I know there's more, but he's running with the twelve. Okay? Therefore, Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing that the large crowd was coming. So, I imagine, based upon the two gospels' accounts, is that Jesus looked at them and says, you give them something to eat. And one of the disciples, based upon looking at the treasury and knowing what they had, said, you know, that'd be about 200 denarii of food. And then he's watching them continue to come, and then he poses a question to Philip. Himself, And he says to Philip as he's watching them come, where are we going to buy bread so that we can eat these? Now, why would he say that unless someone's already suggested? So he said to Philip, where are we going to buy the bread so that we can eat these? Because the disciples have already suggested. Now, look what it says in the next verse, though. This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Verse 7. Now, look what Philip answers. He said, 200 denarii worth of bread in his summation is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. So even though we have the resource, oh, you don't. Even though we have the financial resource to meet a need, the Lord's like, money isn't it today. Dominion is. <laughs> Now let's jump back into Mark's account. Mark chapter 6, we'll pick back up verse 38. And he said to them, how many, no, um, how many loaves do uh, you have? Go look. And they found, uh, and, and when they went out, they said five and two fish. And he commanded them to sit down by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. Now he has in his account two, 200 denarii. We know that. And it, and, it was, and it was an estimation. You know, there's no indication that he couldn't have had more. Yeah. Right, right. Philip's estimation, based upon whatever his gifting was, because you understand, Jesus had guys that were professionals. Yeah, right. He had four professional fishermen. He had a tax collector. Yeah. That guy knew how to do some math. Philip might have said, Matthew, what you thinking? <laughs> and we just didn't get the account. They said, well, I was talking with Matthew, although we're not saying it. And he just says to him, man, 
you know, cool. We don't know that he could have been talking to Matthew. And Matthew's like, I'm just telling you right now, it's just not going to be enough. Uh, I don't know that 200, because again, if Philip's the one talking, then he's the only one the Holy Ghost has given the account to. Doesn't mean he wasn't listening to somebody else. I'm just, now I can't prove that, but you can't disprove it, is what I'm saying. I can prove we had a tax collector. I can prove we had four fishermen. I can prove we had people from different sectors of society that came with Jesus, which means there were natural talents that they had that helped aid Jesus' ministry. And so he gets five loaves and two fish, and he divided them up, the two fish among them all, and they ate. Now, it looks what, let me go back to verse 40. When he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking it up towards heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples to set them before them and he divided up the two fish among them all and they all ate and were satisfied and they picked up all up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces and also of the fish there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves now we know another gospel says besides the women and children and if I'm not mistaken correct me on my wrong these people have been with Jesus for about three days without eating listening to his words and now he's like now that I'm done teaching I'm not going to send them away. I'm going to take care of them naturally. But I'm not going to use my finance to do it, although I have it. I'm going to exercise my dominion. The reason why many believers possess no authority or dominion on the earth is because they only recognize Jesus as the God of heaven. But in Matthew 28, 18, it's not here. I'm just quoting it. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Boy, you're glad he got it on the earth. And the reason he has it on the earth is so he can transfer when you get up underneath his kingship. The dominion mandate on our lives so that we can operate as the little kings in the earth. He's the king of and the Lord of, which means you have supreme authority in the earth realm underneath the Lord that now sits on the throne in heaven because thrones are in kingdoms, not religions. And we've been raised up and seated with him in heavenly places where King Jesus sits by the Father and when there's something going on, he says, Dad, they're talking to me about this situation. And the Father says, Son, tell them this. And then he speaks to the Holy Ghost in us and he says, This is how the Father wants you to do it. Now, when he says that, that doesn't mean that you have to have the finance to accomplish it if you're a dominionaire. And it may mean that you actually have the finance, but the Holy Ghost says, don't spend it. Exercise dominion instead. Don't limit your childlike abilities to the other God of the world. We use that. But even when we have it, doesn't mean we go to it. Because when you're dominionaire first, (laughs) then you'll never be concerned about what you actually possess. Even when you possess a lot. (laughs) Because there's some things in the gospel that you just need the finance. There's no, and again, if the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, then by all rights, we should have it. I get it. But the, the plan and purpose for my life is not on stagnant because it hasn't showed up yet. Because I'm in dominion where I'm at now, and when as I'm obedient to God to do what he says right now with the resource that I have, because I could get in a situation that all I need in this moment is five loaves and two fish, and it'll do the whole job. I'm going to give you an example. We were building in one of my, our locations a privacy fence for our school. And so a generous board member bought the wood fence pickets to put on the fence. We had built the frame, and all we had to do was just lay the pickets in, you know, nail them up. He shows up with the trailer, hears all the material, lays it down. Now, I am in construction because I have done a lot of remodel. 
right? I am a builder. I am a builder, okay? I'm not a builder by trade. I'm a builder by the Spirit, and it makes me build naturally. They lay that down, and, the, and I looked at it, and I'm like, that is not enough. And now, I'm already asking the question. Well, I know what's in the account, so this won't be enough to finish it. And, you know, I technically don't have the finance for it, right? So at the end of the day, I, you know, we'll figure out how it is. And so I'm helping nail with the nail gun, putting up one, give me another one. And, and I'm saying inside, not the hill. I didn't look at the board members, man, that's ain't enough. Thanks, but no thanks. But on the inside, this is not enough. Give me another one. Man, this is, this is just not enough because I'm thinking, you know, how am I going to get the rest because this is not going to finish the job, you understand? I'm going to have to get it somewhere else, and it's not in the account. We have these other stuff to pay, but it's just not enough, but we'll figure it out. And I probably got about from uh, Apostle to Andrew. And the Spirit of the Lord say, is that what you're going to call it? And I knew what he was saying, prophet. Dude, I've been trained. Call those things that be not as they were. What am I doing? But here's the thing. There's a natural thing. And for some reason, we act like what happened with loaves and fish can't actually happen today. With us. So I made a correction in my spirit. I said, thank you, Lord, there's more than enough. Thank you, Lord, there's more than enough. And I knew initially when I started, because I had it go all the way down, and then it would turn this way, and then it would come back, and then it would jog this way, and then it would go this way, and then it would come back a little bit, turn here, and go in. That's kind of how the fence was. You get the design? Okay. I knew it would go all the way down and turn the first corner. Seriously, that was it. I got down to the end, turned the corner, turned the next corner, turned the next corner, turned the next corner, turned the next corner. And I am coming up, and I get to Andrew, to Apostle Estrada, to be finished. And the last picket went up. And the Lord said, if you'd have called it from the beginning, you wouldn't have had the gap. Your gap's the same amount that you said you didn't have enough. He says, you can buy that. I don't know how. All I know is when... The life of God in you gets on material. I'm not under the death realm anymore. And I don't know how Jesus pulled that fish out of his hand and gave it to his first disciple and pulled it and gave it to his next and gave it to his next. Say, now y'all go do that. Okay, you come here. Here's that fish again. I don't know what was going on on the body of that fish, but all I know is those two fish and those five loaves fed all the guys and all the women and all the kids, and then they picked up an offering. So I don't know how one of all those pickets could all of a sudden turn into another picket, but by God, they did. Because I'm a dominionaire. And I didn't wait on a... From that point, I said, God, I'll never wait on a project, project again for finance. I'll never wait on a project. Same preschool in the location I'm in now, we needed to build a cinder block wall. Cinder blocks are a little bit more than pickets. So I had an amount. It was not enough to finish it. I said, let's build that wall. Right? So, my guys dug a trench, dropped down the first layer. You can't even see that one. And I'm talking, it's like, oh, 120 feet. You know, it's kind of got a curve in it. It was at least 120 feet or more. I mean, I can't, I mean, my first pallet, you couldn't even see it. It was in the ground. Then we ran the second one. You can see just a little bit. Got to the third one. Now we're running some rebar in it, right? And I only have about four pallets. But those guys were working it. All of a sudden, I wasn't there, but we were believing God. I said, now listen, you say you've got more than enough. Now, I don't know what that means. I'm just saying you say that when you're working this project. Because I've learned. And again, I'm not the only one with authority. I didn't have to stand there and say it. I just needed my congregation members to be in faith and call it too. 
While I was gone, a guy was driving by the back side of the property, came back, turned in, drove up to my guys working the project, and says, rolled his window down, and said, What are y'all doing? Oh, we're building a, ball, a wall, you know, for our preschool, you know, so we can have our kids in this playground area. He said, you know, I've got a whole bunch of cinder blocks in my house that I'm not even using. You guys want to come and... You know what they said, right? <laughs> yes. So even though in that instance, God didn't actually make what we had multiplied to finish... He had another supply somewhere else that couldn't get to me unless I was working what I already, what did Jesus say? What do we have? He said, what do, you, what do we have? Man, we got five loaves and two fish. That's more than enough. And here's the thing. You get it. Okay. Let me say it this way. <laughs> what if... All I'm required to do is sow five loaves and two fish. Because, see, once it's in the hands of a dominionaire, it's actually more than enough to feed the 5,000 plus the kids. I never despise an offering. Come on, how many pastors are here? Don't you wish that your tithe and offering every week came in and it was the exact same number? I mean, you get the report. I remember one July 4th, we did an outside event. And, you know, we did fireworks and we had games, you know, and it was such a great time. But it, I had an offering bucket outside and I didn't press. Offering that week was $30. 30 bucks. I did not get up on Sunday and say, y'all didn't give. I didn't stress one bit. I said, well, that's all right, Lord. I thank you for the 30. Because, again, it's not, your, it's not my responsibility to stretch what you get. It's, when you, it's your responsibility to determine what does the king want to do with what just got him. What is the... Because I don't care whether you in Africa, whether you in Cambodia. I don't care. If you're feeding those girls rice and you get to the very bottom of the bag and there's about 5 to 20 grains of rice, what do we do in the U.S.? We throw that away. Oh, you don't want to hear this. But what was happening with the widow woman when Elijah showed up? Because he was a dominionaire. He said, the Lord sent me. He said, uh, you got anything to eat? Well, I got a little bit of meal and oil. I'm going to make a cake for me and my son. We're going to die. You know there's a famine. Now, the Lord said, I've commanded a widow to do this for you. Obviously, she did not believe that at the time. She hadn't got the memo. But the man said, make me a cake first. And then by his word says, make you and yourself, and it's not going to run out. Now, she had to believe that. Now, we, again, do we fantasize? Do we act like that he, she made the cake for him, served him, and let him eat while they still hungry, and then makes it for herself and her son eat? Do you think that that barrel that had flour, all of a sudden, she opened up and it was full? It's, if we live by faith and not by sight, it is it was, it's easier for me to assume, and it would be more accurate based upon God's nature, that every time they open, that same dinky amount was there the next day. But what do we do with dinky amounts? We throw it away, which means now we don't even have in our possession the thing that can multiply to the next day because we're too worried about we don't have the money. We don't have the money. So again, you're in Africa, right? You're in Uganda, and you got a little bit of stuff here, right? And you're like, Lord, I need some... What you need is what you have. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you got one fruit, maybe it's time to cut that thing in half, eat half, and then the next day, you're going to cut it in quarter, eat that, but you may find out that three weeks later, you're still eating off the same doggone apple. I 
would say this, eat your apple, set it down in the core, and see if the thing turns into another apple the next day. We discard tubes of toothpaste. And I'm not saying, because a lot, well, I don't want to seem like I'm in poverty. I'm just saying, if finances aren't there yet, you can step back and say, based upon the resource I have of finance and things that need to be purchased, I'm going to pay this bill with the money instead of groceries because I have a little bit in the cupboard. You got to ask God, Lord, what do I do? Because at the end of the day, don't sit around and say, well, I'm broke. We don't have enough for food. You may have enough in the counter for a whole month. You could have it for a whole season. But you're not exercising faith to find out. Because you think you don't have it because you don't have the money. Instead of taking dominion. Come on, you hearing what I'm saying? Now here's, get this. (laughs) it's not the sower's responsibility to multiply the seed it's mine because I'm the dominionaire it's not the sower that's responsible to make my budget bigger it's mine because I'm the dominionaire I'm just going to be candid. How does a church the size of about 475 adults buy a 200,000 square foot mall on 26 acres? Congregationally speaking, we should be in the thousands before we jump bite off on something like that. But have you ever noticed that God's kind of like, yeah, I like to play with numbers. (laughs) He has a book. He's like, Gideon, we got to go to war, son. You the mighty man of valor. It's like, you crazy. You picked the wrong guy. But after he could, you know, goes through a couple tests and realizes, okay, I'll do it, 33,000 people show up. And Gideon's like, praise God, confirmation, man, I am a mighty man of valor. I have such an army. We're going to go take the Midianites. And the Lord's like, bro, you got way too many people. This is a problem. Because when I take y'all in with that many, you're going to assume because you had that much, you didn't need me. So why don't you go ahead and just ask those who are really scared that they act like they're standing with you and tell them if they are, go home. 23,000 people went to the house. Two-thirds. So they were, they were pretend warriors. <laughs> then he looks, he said, bro, you got way too much, man. This, this ain't going to work. We, gonna, we got another test. Go have them drink some water. Now, you know that day was tough on Gideon. He's like, now, the people that are pulling it up to their mouth, that's the ones you keep. But everybody's got their face in it. Go. And, you know, with 10,000 people, he's going like, go home, 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 go home for an hour. Go home. Oh, my gosh. Who stay? <gasps> you. You get to stay with me. <laughs> 300. Because there are times in our life of faith that God wants the dominion heir to manifest. When it came to the mall, can I say this? I've been here how many times? How many years now? Seven years? We've been there seven years? Seven years. And for the last six years, we've been talking about we're going to buy them all. I am glad to report we have purchased them all. It is done. By the grace of God and the power of dominion, it came. And not because I had massive givers. The largest gift ever given to the $1.1 million I had to raise was 80000 The majority of the gifts 
were 10,000 or less. And yet, it was enough. It was enough that every time they planted it, that it could stay off any other potential buyer. It was enough that no matter how much the devil wanted in those six years say, you can't have it, you won't get it, and I kept calling it, thank you, because I had a decree as a dominionaire. This is our property. Thank you, Lord, for 2121 US 1 South. This is our land. This is yours. Let me, I, I just get crazy with you. Do not do this unless the Lord's told you. Because again, what God told me to do, he may not have told you to do, so please do not do this. When I got in contract, I had to put 250000 down hard, which means if we did not close on the date, I'd lose it. We didn't have it, so we extended for another 75000 hard for a different date, or we'd lose it. We didn't make it and came out of contract. 325,000 dollars of people's seed is in possession of the owner that I have no legal right to in the natural, but I had a spiritual right to. And the Lord told He told me now, and don't you do this, do not do this. Do not do this. But in my case by the spirit, the Lord says, that was your anchor seed. You never yielded, and they never could have taken that from you. Now, I had to rent some more space in the process. So wisdom told me in my negotiation of an additional 10,000 square feet when I'm wanting to buy it and raising money for it, and I'm not even in contract, yeah. which means anyone could have bought it, yeah. naturally speaking, yeah. but not for a dominionaire. Who is firmly persuaded yes. that it can't be no other way. Yes. And even, even, let me just say, even if I was stupid and wrong, God's mercy was super big then, at least in that moment. I, I mean, I can tell you that. No, I lean a little more to my heart was right. We were pushing and it was seeding the ground. And I was firmly persuaded before I ever put a dollar towards it. In fact, I went off before I put the first down and I said, Lord... Now, if you don't want me to do this, I am not doing it. And the Lord says, see that house there, son? I was driving down A1A on the beach side, taking my camper to go camp with my wife and do some, and I was praying. Setting up the camper early, and I'm just like, I got to get it in my spirit. You know, I got to know, because I got to hear the king, man. Because if I hear the king, forget about it, it's over, it's done. King says, son, see that house right there? Yes, sir. How much do you think it is? Millions. He said, what else you notice about the house? I said, well, it's got hurricane, sh um, you know, shutters, not literal, but, you know, covered up for the hurricane. I said, it's probably somebody up north's summer home or winter home, right? He said, son, you are correct. He said, um, if a man can have a winter home in Florida that's millions of dollars, don't you think I can get you a mall? I said, yes, sir, that's all I need to hear, and I never relented. So when I put the 250 down, I was convinced it's ours. What I didn't realize is that we just wouldn't get it in the time frame of the, and when I wanted them to extend and give more, because I'm like, I don't give a rip. If we extend this thing, I'll keep giving it hard because we'll just keep coming up with it. But then when all of a sudden they relented, I was like, Jesus. Yeah. Talking about, you know, emotional sh stress wanting to show up, but I wouldn't let it because I'm not led by my soul. I just got dogged about it. Yeah. I heard the king. Now seeds in the ground. Yeah. And it'll hold this thing. Yeah. And I kept calling that thing and kept collecting. Then when I got the money and I called them up and said, hey, I'm ready to negotiate. They said, you're going to have to come up with another 10%. Now the devil's like, you're an idiot. You're so stupid. You look so dumb. You know how dumb you look right now. Do you understand how stupid? They're going to run you out of town. Not only have you lost their $325,000. But now they're not going to sell it to you and they're going to want more. And they were asking for more. So what did I do? Lord Jesus. I know I would have heard. So obviously there's something else. I need to know. So I would say, let me, I just want to talk to the owner. Well, let me talk to the owner. So I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, you can get to the owner. 
So I went to my attorney and I was having a conversation and, and about a different situation and the attorney, he says, you know, no one ever goes through the vice president of leasing to buy a property. He says, you really need to talk to the owner. I said, I have tried. It's a labyrinth. I cannot. And I know if I could talk to him because I've talked to him once before. You want to hear about a dominion heir? <laughs> the first time I ever talked to the man was because I was three months behind in rent. Now, let me tell you why I was three months behind in rent. Because the vice president of leasing stood beside me while we were looking at the mall to lease it. And I said, I want to lease it. But here's the problem. I've been in the county. I know exactly. Y'all all right? Because yeah. I guess I'm going along again. I apologize. Um, I cannot be in two locations. I cannot do that. So I know to remodel, it's going to take some time. I got to go through, you know, codes and permits and all that stuff. Pastor Earl, don't you worry about it. We have 26 malls. We've worked with tenants all the time. We can push your rent commencement back. It's no issue. We do it all the I said, because I cannot be in two locations. That works all the time. So, in good faith, I got one month extended, and that was it. So I went up to the ownership. It had three names associated with it. Met the last partner that had come on. And he sat in his desk and began to unveil to me how the mall works. The anointing on my life caused me to get into the ears of their problem because the anchor store belt was in the middle of the property they could not repurpose the land like they wanted and they were stuck and they could not get them out of their lease and the Lord says as belt goes the mall goes our belt in a mall that got shut down for six years was the number third? It was number three in online sales in the nation, because Anchor Faith Church called it prosperous the whole time. Because we knew the mall goes as belt goes, and if it prospers, it empowers them to stay. Oh my goodness! So I got stuck in two locations. This is difficult. But we remodeled. It was tough. It was a tough season. It was bad. I, I sold my Jeep to pay for stuff. I mean, I was liquidating. Right? I got letters from them evicting me in 10 days on more than one occasion. But God knew what I said to them and what they said to me. And even though contractually they had a legal right... God would never let them do it because of the dominion of my word. It held the authority. Oh, Talking about emotional stress, this is all that kind of stuff, but you just can't deal with that. You just got to let that go. You, prophet, you got to be led by the Spirit, man. You just can't do it. And again, if you're going to do something for God, you're just going to take you out some dang crazy places, man. At the end of the day. Perfect world, they would have done what I asked, and we wouldn't have had this problem in the first place. They would have not relented on their word. And God held them to their word. So he shows up to see the remodel. And I said, it's his name. <laughs> and I said, um, told him the whole context again. We're all over here now. I do not have that. I will catch up. He said, Pastor Earl, I'm from... The show me state, which is Missouri. He said, I want you to show me. So he wrote an amendment to my lease and held me personally responsible for the three months, $30,000. If I did not make the rent on time for one year, I personally owed him $30,000. But if I did, he would forgive it. Needless to say, it was forgiven. Are you hearing me? Then 
They came to us about buying. We negotiated. You've already heard that part. But what you did not hear is because of the challenges. I said, Lord, something's got to move and shift here during this process of I'm out. We've got money hard, but we're believing. And all of a sudden, the last partner left. Then the second partner who had been with him for 22 years said, I believe our visions are going in two different directions, and they split. The only owner standing was the one who said, I'm from the show me state, and he gave me an opportunity. Now I'm sitting with my lawyer trying to figure out how we're going to get this mall because the Lord knows. It's already his. I just got to figure out the voice of God. I'm a dominionaire. Yeah. Right. And then nobody walked up and given me cash. No one's come and paid off the thing before. No one dropped $20 million where I could walk in with a check. That would have been awesome. And believe you me, I would have done something. Which it wasn't $20 million, but you understand what I'm saying. Didn't happen. My dominion there had to kick in. And my attorney says, I'll find out where he lives. You can send it to his home address. I'm talking about a battle then. I've never had more warfare in my mind than that one. I am fixing to send a letter to the man's personal residence, and he, I'm, I'm leaving the business structure and going to his home. Am I violating all opportunities of business ethics right now? How's he going to handle that? The Lord said, send it. And I wrote this phenomenal letter by the Spirit, honoring him, thanking him for all the opportunities, where we were at, and sent it. Five days later on my way home, I look down at my phone and his name pops up. I pulled off the highway. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Pastor Earl, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing, sir? Well, you know, I'm in my vehicle heading back this, that, and the other. I got your letter. <laughs> yes, sir. He says, you know what? I think we can work something out. Can I call you tomorrow? Yes, sir, yes, sir you can. What time? So we negotiated time, and the next day came. I was like a buzzard, you know, <laughs> circling my office. <laughs> you know, you're just like, what time is it? Oh, what time is it? <laughs> you just, woo, waiting. You're know, like, sit down at your desk, you know, you're like, run everybody out of the house, right? You're like, y'all go somewhere. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> and so we started talking. And so we talked about the, the money. Well, you know, it's worth more now, Pastor Earl. I understand. I can see that. I see what you're saying. Right? I said, but I want the same price. He said, well, what was our agreement on the interest rate? Because here's the thing. Get this now. <laughs> he said, I said, this was the interest rate. I like to go here. I said, there's been a lot of deferred maintenance. He said, okay. So he came back and he said, I'll give it for the price we originally said at a lower interest rate, and I'll give you 50000 back at closing to put back into it. And he financed it himself to the guy who was three months behind at one time. But he gets better because I'm thinking he's financing it through his business. When I came down to the closing table, I bought it for 11 one, gave him 1.1 1 .1 down. He only required a tithe from me. I financed $10 million of which his company put up $6 million. 
And out of his own personal account, he financed $4 million. Then, I have him on my board. I have five years to get additional financing. It's a balloon. I just believe God can pay it off in the five years. Myself personally, at the end of the day, because I'm a dominionaire. And this pen, Bishop Garraway bought for me. The first year that we were together, Never met the man in my life. And Apostle Estrada, you know how he is. He's a connector. And he says, Pastor Earl, you got a vehicle. Can you take Bishop to get some mats for his car? Oh, yeah. I'll do it. Love to. Never met the man before in my life. And here we are driving to the Mall of Millennium. Stopped by the dealership. He picked up his floor mat. Says, you know what? I need to go over to the mall and pick up a gift for a, a pastor friend of mine. We parked one place and walked the whole thing to get to Mont Blanc store. He pulls out some pins, and then he brings me over and says, Pastor, what do you think about this pin here? And I was like, yeah, that's a cool pin. Wrote well. I said, yeah, it's nice. He said, okay, I want all three of these, you know, and he bought them. And then he handed me the bag, and he said, this is yours. It's $450 for this pin. Now, I could tell Bishop did not want to go all the way through the mall again to my vehicle. So I said to him, I'll go get my vehicle and just drive around here. Can, can I do that? He says, yes. So I had my little Mont Blanc bag, <laughs> and I was walking through the mall, speed walking now, because, you know, i got to get back to the man of God to pick him up, right? And I'm going, and I'm saying, God, what am I going to do with a $450 pen? <laughs> I don't even use pens, Lord. I write with pencils. I mean, I'm subject to lose the pen, Lord. I mean, what, am, what is happening? And I heard the Lord say to me, you'll sign them all with that pen because kings write with pens like that. So I have a picture on closing day that I signed with a prophetic pen and sent a picture to that man that he had forgotten about, I'm sure. Because I'm a dominionaire.